Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you on behalf of Faculty of Planning. Uh, today we are starting a new initiative as part of the series of events that we are doing uh, as part of the, our FT50 events. So we thought that we have to have one commemorative lecture series. And I must admit that we have given it a bit of a lofty title that towards a new paradigm of urban planning. And my job is to, one, justify that title. Uh, and the reason why we, we gave that title was, I think this is also a very good time for us, 50 years since our establishment, to actually see uh, not only what we have achieved as an institution, but also as a practice, research, a group of professionals. Where are we at in urban planning? And sometimes we also have to ask some hard questions to us, our community. And those questions could be many, and they can be asked from a different vantage point. But some important ones which we must ask are, we are often accused of, of accepting the fact that planning is often a failure. And that is not as, a, as an exception, but as a rule. And are we really serious about that? Plans don't get implemented routinely. Do we have a contempt for self-organizing systems or markets or people's choices? Do we also have contempt for private properties? Do we excessively use state powers of coercion in urban planning? Right? These are some of the set of questions which, will, which are actually uncomfortable questions. But we must ask this question at this juncture as to what are the kind of value systems and ethos that we work with. And that doesn't mean that we do not celebrate our achievements. Of course, there are other events as part of our, our set of events which will celebrate our achievements. But we also require some discussion on also the crisis of our profession. Okay, some bit of a catharsis. I'm not saying that this lecture series is particularly for that. But what we mean to achieve as part of this lecture series is if we have to look in the future, on what foundations, on what kind of value systems do we start building a new paradigm? Okay, so we are making a very humble attempt and here we are going to hear from various people from various walks of life, state of art ideas, sometimes in the realm of urban planning, sometimes outside the realm of urban planning. And we are asking some of these questions, not exactly these questions, but very similar questions. Okay? And that's why we thought that it will be a good idea that we start this lecture series. It will go on. We'll have one lecture every two months. Uh, and the idea is that finally we'll put, it, put together all the lectures into some sort of a book form so that it stays with us. So with that idea, we are starting this lecture series. And uh, we are very happy with the kind of first lecture and the gathering that we have here. And without taking much of your time, I would request Dr. Bimal Patel to come and introduce our first speaker and tell us particularly why he's our first speaker of this series. Thank you. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to Ajay Shah for, the, for this lecture. Um, let me just read out the brief uh, bio that he has approved. Uh, he has a very illustrious career working with the Indian government uh, and improving its finance policy amongst some of the key reforms that he has been part of is the bankruptcy court, uh, the GST system that we moved from the old excise regime to the GST system, and many, many, many other reforms over, over the years. He has worked with the finance ministry, various other finance institutions of the country to try and change the way in which finance policy works in the country. 
Um, he studied at IIT Bombay and USC Los Angeles. He has held positions at Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy, uh, the Indira Gandhi Institute for Development Research, Department of Economic Affairs at the Ministry of Finance, and National Institute for Public Finance and Policy, NIPFP. He is now part of X. KDR Forum and Jindal Global University. His research is at the intersection of economics, law, and public administration. His second book, which all of you know quite well, co-authored with Vijay Kelka, In Service of the Republic, The Art and Science of Economic Policy. I guess all of you uh, 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 know it well. Uh, featured in Bloomberg's Global 2020 Best Books, Best Books of the Year 2020, on business and leadership. Okay. His work can be accessed on his homepage, and I'm sure you can find it on the internet when you want to. Now, I just say a few brief words about what uh, um, um, Rutul also mentioned, and, um, you know, uh, why it's, it was important to have Ajay Shah here speaking at this forum. Uh, we are all in the business of urban planning or urban design. I guess that's what this, the faculty of planning is about, urban planning, urban design. Uh, we intervene in urban economies, land markets, in the making of cities, through a variety of instruments, development plans of cities, town planning schemes, building bylaws, big public infrastructure projects, uh, transportation policy, transportation projects. Uh, we are all involved in the work of public policy. And uh, it's extremely important that we have the conceptual tools for understanding better what we are doing. Uh, let me try and explain this in a slightly different way. I studied all of my planning in the US. I didn't study any planning in India. And when we studied planning in the US, uh, the default assumption was that actually people can manage their affairs quite well. Government should not get involved should not be in the business of, of, of intervening in the affairs of people unless it can be justified, unless it is absolutely necessary. So the standard question in the planning theory exam was, when is planning justified? When is it justified to make some policy that will affect people? When is it necessary to control people, regulate people? When is it necessary for the government to get involved in the business of, of city building and city making? It was kind of assumed that if you let people do things on their own, if you let the market operate on its own, it do fairly well, but there would be many reasons, many, there are many instances when markets fail, even sometimes, uh, even, even for structuring markets, you need the government to intervene. So the planner, planning student, typical planning student, had to sit down and write down, uh, uh, you know, uh, give which are the situations in which planners can dabble in the affairs of the city. When are we, are, when are we allowed to intervene? Uh, when, when is our intervention justified? Well, when I came back to India and started practicing, I realized uh, that the the world was completely the other way around. When should people be allowed to do anything on their own? When should they not be required to take government permission to do something? When should you know, markets be allowed to function on their own? This was pretty much like the situation in families. You know, they're the, when raising their kids, America, you know, in, in the US where I was and in Europe also where I was, our kids had a lot of freedom. Parents didn't intervene, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and determine every aspect of what, the, what, what, what their children were to do. The kids were free. It was understood that they would manage fairly well. You have to support them. You have to structure the environment for them. But freedom is a default assumption. And then when the parents are allowed to intervene was 
something that had to be justified. Well, here it was the opposite, right? I mean, Indian families, traditionally, uh, the elders want to decide everything, including who you will marry, who you will not marry, whether you'll become an engineer, doctor, lawyer, which school you will go to, how. Uh, there, there's a, uh, we, we come from a traditional society where top-down control is pretty much the norm rather than the, uh, you know, the exception. And I discovered, my God, this whole culture here is, is absolutely seeped into the profession of planning. Uh, I mean, Indian traditional culture was reinforced by the kind of bureaucratic socialism that the Indian state had adopted, where the Indian government wanted to control every aspect of the economy, who can make what, where, how, what it should be, what it should cost, so on and so forth. And Indian urban planning was pretty much that. You sat down and made a plan that told everybody what they could and could not do. And since 25, 30 years, the big project in India has been to loosen the grip of this control-oriented planning. Uh, with some successes, but there is still a long, long way to go. If we are going to be planners, we have to understand that we are intervening in the economy. Uh, we can create more problems uh, more easily. There's more ways with which we can do harm than we can do good. And when we were thinking of what should be the course at SEPT, one of the big things that was introduced was to have a microeconomics course here which, uh, you know, since last two or three years, we've been doing a lot more of it, more strongly. And the other one course was how government works and something about public policy. And we were trying to figure out how to teach that course here. And it is at that point that I came across Ajay Shah's book. It's a, it's a terrific book, easy to read, profound, insightful, absolutely relevant for the Indian context. It's rare to find books like this that actually talk from the experience of trying to bring about reform. So very quickly, we have turned it into uh, a textbook that, that you will read just now, but hopefully you will keep with you and you will carry with you. And when you are part of the Indian government or some consulting firm that is working with the Indian government or some consulting firm uh, that has placed you inside the government, you will read this book and think about what you are doing. It will help you reflect on what you are doing. And I, I hope that for a long period, this book becomes something that you, 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 you go back to, just to read and check what are you doing, how are you doing, uh, and, and the book helps you question. I, I found it immensely useful, um, uh, sort of a, a, a book. Uh, so um, I'm very pleased that you've written a book like this. I'm very pleased that we can now, uh, it's, it's prescribed as a sort of a textbook. I'm very pleased that there's a paperback edition that costs only 350 rupees. I mean, that is uh, 345 rupees to be precise. This is absolutely super for, 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 for students to be able to purchase. And you must... Uh, any one of you is still reading out of library copies, please go and purchase one, keep it, read it. And with that, let me just stop and let me ask uh, Ajay Shah to talk about, uh, about his book and about the topic that he has selected for today. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful and privileged <clears throat> to be here in front of you today. I have always been aware of SEPT University. This is my first time here. And uh, I got exposure to some of the backstory and the ethos, and it's just wonderful. I mean, it is so great that there are these kinds of intellectual organizations in India. God knows we need more of this to become a prosperous and successful country. Okay. I'm going to do a talk today on one narrow piece out of the intellectual firmament of the book. This is about 
the respective roles of the union government, the state government, and the city government. Okay? So it's a nice compact piece, one that I thought was particularly relevant to this group. Because while in a way you may think of urban planning as uh, the affairs of a city, you will rapidly see a very messy world in India where there is an interplay between the union government and the state government and the city government and all that. So it is one piece out of the book and one piece that I think I know something about, which all of you will find uh, directly interesting and useful and relevant. Okay, so I'm also going to position myself on a bit of a zero base that this is about what should be, meaning I'm going to show you many times that this is not how the world works, but I'm going to take you to the first principles understanding of why should certain things be done at a union or a federal government? Why should certain things be done at a state government? Why should certain things be done at a city government? Okay. So it's not just about the question of how is the constitution and the facts on the ground in India organized and how do we practice our trade under these conditions, but also about the larger question of what is the logic of what's being done and why is it being done? Okay, so I'm going to get started at the problem of heterogeneity. My good friend Lan Pritchett always says to me that the dominant problem of India is the heterogeneity. Okay, India is very, very, very diverse. He says that uh, there are many metrics whereby the ratio of the best places in India divided by the worst places in India, that ratio is the same as the ratio of the best places in Latin America divided by the worst places in Africa. Okay, so India is as diverse as a union of Latin America and Africa. Okay, that's how much heterogeneity is there in India. So we should think a lot about that heterogeneity. Let me bring you uh, some facts about that heterogeneity. Uh, CMIE makes a household survey database. They have cut up the country into 100 pieces which are called homogeneous regions. Okay. By the way, amusingly enough, in uh, 1985 or something, there was a socio-cultural classification of India by the union government, and they had cut up India into 85 pieces. Okay. So about 85, about 100 pieces is a useful intellectual uh, abstraction using which to think about India. So as an example, think of Kerala. It's very useful to think of Kerala as North Kerala, Central Kerala and South Kerala. There are really three parts of Kerala and they're quite different. They're quite different from each other. If you think of the religious structure, the uh, occupations, the level of prosperity, everything. I mean, there are three different pieces of Kerala. Now, each of them contains many districts, but it's a good intellectual abstraction to think of Kerala as three pieces. Okay, so in similar fashion, applied to the whole country, there are about 100 homogeneous regions that make up in India. So now I want to offer you two facts. The average per capita income of the top five homogeneous regions is 47,000 rupees a month of the household, and the bottom five homogeneous regions is 11,000 rupees a month. Okay, so it's the average household is at 47,000 rupees, or the average household is at 11,000 rupees. So it's about four and a half times from the top to the bottom. Okay, so the richest place is about four and a half times richer than the poorest places. Here's another uh, measure. A great peek into the <coughs> cultural features of India is the cell phone ownership of women. Okay, so what happens in uh, families in India is partly because there is uh, limited resources and under the patriarchy the men folk get favored so more men have cell phones and partly as a part of social control the patriarchy likes to hold back phone ownership from women okay so these two factors come together so what I do is I go measure cell phone ownership amongst females okay by the way of all ages I put it all together cell phone ownership of females in the top five homogeneous regions of India and the bottom five homogeneous regions of India. And the answer is, in the top five homogeneous regions of India, 84% of the females have a cell phone as an individual. Okay, not a family shared phone, an individual personal cell phone. And in the bottom five homogeneous regions, it's 
Okay, so it's 85% to 5%. It's 19 times different. Okay, so this is just to give you a physical flavor that there's a very big phenomenon of heterogeneity. Now, that has important consequences for how we should think about politics and the republic and the state. Under such conditions of heterogeneity, you've got to wonder what should the state do and the answer may not be the same across the different parts of India. So questions about what is the priority, what is the biggest problem that you face, what are the issues that one should push, okay? Those issues will vary a lot depending on what part of the region you look at. Also, on the mechanisms, how might you choose to organize certain state interventions? May vary tremendously depending on where you are in India. So I want to tell you a personal story. My wife happens to be from Kerala. Uh, one day she had, she was bitten by the family dog. Okay, and uh, I was present, but I was an observer, and others were solving the whole situation. Okay, so surprise, surprise number one. Everybody knew in that setting that the correct answer was to go to a government clinic. Okay, now that caught me by surprise because for many of us in the regions of India that we live in, we would not think of going to a government clinic. Okay, if a family member was bitten by a dog, we would not think of going to a government clinic. We would think of going to a private clinic. Okay, but it just felt normal and effortless that they chose to go to a government clinic. Okay, so I went along, followed her into the government clinic. Okay, now what a bad doctor will do is say, oh, you've got a dog bite, let me zap you with uh, rabies injections. Okay, the uh, rabies vaccine, uh, you've got to take multiple shots of that and it stops the rabies virus from creeping towards your skull. Surprise, surprise, the doctor in a government facility asked the correct question, which is, was it a stray dog who ran away or was it a family dog? The answer is, it's a family dog. Okay, is there any problem in the behavior of the dog? No. Is the dog under monitoring? Yes. Then the correct answer of the doctor was, go home, you don't need anything. You just need some antiseptic dressing. Why? Because it turns out that if a dog has rabies, the dog will be hopping mad the behavior will change completely and the dog will die in a day. While it takes the rabies virus a week to reach into the human brain. So you have ample early warning that when the dog dies, you know that there is a deep problem here, then you run to the clinic, I'll give you the shots. It's a correct answer. Most Indian medical professionals would not give you this answer. They'd be very happy to just blast vaccine into you and not think about it. I was shocked and surprised. This was a government facility. So the people, the upper class affluent people felt that the most appropriate place to go to was a government clinic. And when we went to the government clinic, we actually got a sophisticated, correct answer. Whereas in most medical professionals in India, they would do the wrong answer, which is they just zap you with the rabies vaccine. Now in most parts of India, you would not get these behaviors. In most parts of India, people like us, if you have a family member who has a do dog bite, would prefer to go to a private facility. We just have a non-specific, vague notion that, look, we're not going to a government facility. And in most parts of the country, if you went to a government facility, there may not be a doctor standing there. And that doctor will probably not know to ask the correct question and do the correct clinical diagnosis. That's an example of the heterogeneity of India. There are different, different levels of capability all across the country. The Indian state is not monolithic. Some places work better than others. The kinds of burden, the tasks, that you can place upon the shoulders of state employees and state organizations are not the same all across the country. There are different levels of capabilities in different parts of the country. So I want to push on two main points. That proposition one, there's very high heterogeneity in India. It's not one country. It's actually at least 100 different places with very different capabilities. And the second, that if you look at the working of the state, the public management problem inside the state is also highly heterogeneous. There are some parts of India where certain things kind of work relatively well, and there are other parts of India where the same kind of capability would be a bit unthinkable. Now, how do you do optimal public administration when faced with this kind of heterogeneity? Okay, this problem has been faced in all large countries. Okay, so whether you say USSR or Australia or Canada or the US, or the European Union or India. These are the largest 
countries of the world, and they all have this problem of, of these two issues of heterogeneity in the people and heterogeneity in the state. And the answer to this is something that is called federalism. It's a word that is used internationally, which is not used much in India, but it's a nice and important word, and we should become more comfortable in using it in our everyday life. It's the idea that you have a decentralized structure of government. So you don't place all functions in the union government. You do some things in the union government, you do some things in the state government, you do some things in a city stroke village government. And it is better to have this kind of decentralized thinking all over the country because in every local place there is a different problem, there's a different setting, there's a different set of priorities, and there are different capabilities of the state. Okay, so this is the subject of decentralization. Now I want to drill further, and I want to ask the question, very well, we're going to do a decentralized thing, we have a, a constitution which is imbued with a federal character, so what should be done at the union? What should be done at the state? What should be done at the city? Okay, fair question. How would you think about it? What functions would you place where? Okay, now in every federal country, this question has to be faced because you can't have some mess of different people doing the same thing. Okay, so we have seen recently uh, weird things like uh, Punjab police showing up to arrest somebody in Delhi. Okay, then that doesn't make any sense. So there should be clarity. There should be demarcation of who does what. There should be both legal clarity, but then it should needs to be grounded in principle. So what's the political and economic theory that creates a correct allocation between the work of the union, the work of the state, and the work of the city? Well, the political theorists and the economists have developed a beautiful doctrine around this. Uh, it's uh, called the subsidiarity principle. Okay, so once again, I'm introducing jargon. I request you to memorize and use the jargon in your own speech. It's a very big transition for all of us when we switch from hearing a word and knowing what it means to using it in our own expression. So I encourage you to normalize these words like federalism and the subsidiarity principle in our everyday debates. What is the subsidiarity principle? It's one sentence. It's a simple, striking, beautiful insight. It's one sentence. The proposition is every job of the state should be done at the lowest level at which it can possibly be done. Okay. So ponder this. Every job of the state should be done at the lowest level that it can possibly be done. Okay? So if you can decentralize, always decentralize. If something can be done by the union and the state, do it at the state. If something can be done by the state and the city, do it at the city. Okay? So when in doubt, push things lower. Okay? That's the subsidiarity principle. Of course, that is the first if. If something can be done at a given level of government. So for instance, consider the construction of the Indian rupee. Okay? So every country has a currency and the job of inventing the currency has to be done by somebody that somebody can only be at the level of the union, right? Because you don't want a Gujarat rupee that's different from a Madhya Pradesh rupee. So the only sane way to do the rupee is at the union. It can't go at any other level. So by the subsidiarity principle, we will say that monetary policy should be the work of the union. There should be no role for state governments or city governments in doing monetary policy. Okay? What about mosquito control? Okay, so all of you will know that in public health, there is a major issue which is called vector control. Mosquitoes are disease vectors. The mosquito bites me, takes germs from my body, then it bites you and it inserts the germs into your body. So mosquitoes are disease vectors. They transmit disease from one person to another. So all societies have a role for the state in controlling mosquitoes, which is primarily done by closing puddles. Okay, so the dominant solution is not the man carrying DDT and blowing it around. That happens to be a dumb idea, it doesn't work. The solution that works is covering puddles. So you find every piece of open water, small puddles. Big puddles are not a problem. In big lakes, 
Mosquitoes don't grow because there are natural predators in the water that eat up the mosquito larvae. But when you have a small puddle, typically man-made artificial puddles, that's where mosquitoes thrive because their predators are not there. And so the intervention of the state by way of vector control boils down to having a very detailed field force that will walk around the entire landscape, that has to walk meter by meter through a given territory. And in that territory, either cover the puddle or throw uh, larvae of dragonflies and other creatures who will eat up the larvae of mosquitoes or use some insecticides that kill mosquito larvae. It is a painstaking, detailed operation that has to be done meter by meter. Okay? So uh, you might think, is that even possible? Okay? Can you even dream of mosquito control? Okay, so I want to say two remarkable things to you. First remarkable thing, after the civil war in the United States, so the southern United States is like the northern part of India. So the latitude of Los Angeles is exactly the same latitude as Himachal Pradesh. Okay, so the southern United States is a lot like North India. It's not that different from the kind of weather that we know. You'll be shocked to know that after the civil war, mosquito control and malaria control was taken up with a passion by public health authorities in the United States, and by the late 19th century, malaria had been eradicated in the United States. No modern magic, just controlling puddles. Not even DDT, not even larvae of dragonflies, just a shovel where you cover puddles. That's all, that's what can be done. So it may seem unbelievable to us, but we should wake up and notice that, you know, this can be done. That it's as basic as that. that Employees of the state walking around every square meter of a given territory, covering every small puddle with dirt, and putting an end to puddles in which mosquitoes can breed, can make a transformative difference to the point where the incidence of malaria in the southern part of the United States essentially went to zero by the late 19th century, before any modern science and technology. Today it's become even better because of other techniques, there are larvicides and there are the predators that you introduce into the puddles. So this stuff can be done. Okay? Second, I want to tell you an even more embarrassing story. Did you know that in the early 70s, uh, so in the fl great uh, flush of excitement after the eradication of smallpox in India, which got done in 1974, after that the next giant program taken up in India was malaria control. And this kind of detailed hard work was done in India on a giant scale all over the country. And the incidence of malaria came down by 80%. And then there was a lack of tenacity and staying power on the part of the Indian state, and the program ended, and malaria researched back in India. So the mosquitoes are back in India, and now the mosquitoes have become better, so they also spread uh, dengue fever and Zika fever and so on. So mosquitoes are even more dangerous than they used to be. So even in India, these kinds of things were being done. The grizzled veterans of the 1970s mosquito eradication projects are just retiring today. So I have gone out and met retired or semi-retired civil servants as part of my work in health to just understand the methods of mosquito control that they were doing under Indian conditions in India. But that world has gone, that tradition has gone. We basically no longer fight mosquito control in the Indian state today. And I think that's a mistake. We should do it. Very well. If you think we should do it, where would you think we should do it? Should you do it by the union? Should you do it by the state? Should you do it by the city? Okay, so think about it. What you want is to control a field force. It's a very painful labor-intensive activity. You want to walk over every square meter of a given territory. You want to find puddles and walk in there with a shovel in hand and cover those puddles in dirt. Okay? The answer is this should be done at the city government. This is a problem of detail. Why will this work better at the city government? So what is the logic of the subsidiarity principle? So far I just gave it to you as an ex-cathedra assertion as the 11th commandment. Why does the subsidiarity principle make sense? Why does it work? The answer is twofold. The first is that when something is done by a local government, there is greater local accountability. Okay, so the managers of the local government, the civil servants, the politicians, the local politicians, and the citizenry are all living adjoined to each other. They're talking to each other. They are on each other's cell phone call lists. Okay? So there's much more of a personal feedback loop where if something is not being done, somebody will pick up the phone and tell 
their local politician or their local civil servant, saying, I saw that civil servant goofing off. This guy came, he was supposed to be uh, finding puddles and filling them up with dirt, but instead I found him just sitting at a chai shop and goofing off. Okay? So you generate better accountability when things are done at a lower level. Otherwise, you know, as they say, Delhi dur hai. So to have a civil servant employed by New Delhi sitting in Ahmedabad covering uh, ditches, uh, covering puddles with uh, soil is just not going to be a feedback loop of accountability. Who's going to tell the managers that this guy is not working, that this work is not getting done? Okay, so the first logic is that in local government, you have greater local accountability. There are feedback loops. The people are seeing how public money is being spent. So there is a better chance of getting things done. The second reason why the subsidiarity principle works is that local conditions and local opportunities shape the optimal design and management of public programs. So how you get something done can and should reflect local conditions. So what is the weather, what is the climate, what kind of tools, what kind of equipment, what are the salaries you have to pay people, all these things vary so much locally because of this heterogeneity proposition. So you will get it done better at a local level. Maybe in a more affluent place, you'll have a little more equipment, you'll be more mechanized. Maybe in a more affluent place, you'll start having drones, which will look for sunlight glinting in open water. Okay, so you can keep varying the nature of the implementation, and that will reflect local conditions. Whereas any single union government program will do less well, because it will either target the median, or it will target the richest places, and it will flounder and fail in most parts of the country. So that is why you know, a centralized strategy like JN and URM doesn't make that much sense. You really need the energy and the passion in each city to wake up, think about its own situation, and solve its own problems. I described mosquito control as an example where it makes sense to go down as through the subsidiarity principle. But there's one more story, which is local problems and local preferences. Mosquitoes may not be a problem in Ladakh. Okay, it is so cold and dry in Ladakh that there are no mosquitoes in Ladakh. So again, you should not have a single flat union government program saying we will eradicate mosquitoes in every district of India. You gotta look at local conditions. What are the priorities under those local conditions? And then each place should figure out its own. And that's where you get to local preferences. Okay? Only the local people know what is their point of pain. So through local politics, we should aspire to find that preference aggregation where the state will discover what are the felt needs of the local people and it should pursue the objectives of the local people rather than having somebody in New Delhi determining what should be done in every part of the country. So I've given you four reasons why the subsidiarity principle makes sense. Okay? So reason one, better feedback loops of accountability. Reason two, local uh, decisions about the management and the strategy of how a given objective should be achieved. Reason three, uh, local control on uh, what are the priorities and what I is it that should be done, reflecting local conditions, and that is the uh, that, that is something that is achieved by going lower down. So this is the story of federalism and the subsidiarity principle and the logic of pushing in favor of uh, local government. Now, that has very interesting and important consequences for how we think about uh, state and local government and urban planning and cities. And in one line, what I think it demands for all of us here in India is it demands cadres of local knowledge and local expertise all over the country. So to figure out Rajkot and to do good urban policy for Rajkot ultimately requires both a political system in Rajkot that bubbles up local preferences, but then it requires expertise that is local to Rajkot. So I think we should all dream of data sets and research and knowledge and experts and practitioners that emerge around every important urban agglomeration of the country. Now sometimes it is possible to fuse a couple of locations and reduce the number of locations in India. So if you think that you know within 20 kilometers, within 30 kilometers, they're really much related to each other, fine, it reduces the burden. I seem to think at Janagraha there was some work of this nature 
and they argue that there are really 63 important clusters of cities in India, fine, then you need 63 communities of practitioners, of experts, where there is data, where there's a research literature, where there is an intense local expertise about who are we, what are the problems that we face, what are the stylized facts around our neighborhood, what works and what doesn't work in our neighborhood. The open-mindedness of saying, is there a place that is a lot like my city, which happens to be 600 kilometers from here, and then we can see what those guys are doing and learn from them and maybe import some of those practices. The test being not that X got something right, but X is like me. So places that are like each other have a lot more opportunity for horizontal transfers of knowledge and experience. So some things work, some things don't work. You know, all of us should be skeptical, humble, curious, rational, and keep in that journey of knowledge where we keep challenging our assumptions and we keep experimenting, we keep making mistakes. And then if somebody else in a place much like mine makes an experiment, then I get to free ride on their learning. I should be open to doing that. So I'm not encouraging a NIH not invented here mentality that Rajkot is the only place that creates knowledge for me. Yeah, we should take knowledge flows from elsewhere. But to make Rajkot a great city, we're going to need a body of knowledge and experts and practitioners who are dedicated to Rajkot. And that's the way we will make progress under local control. So on one hand, we need the political system where there is power functions resourcing at Rajkot. And on the other hand, there is a knowledge agenda that we're going to need experts and expertise at the level of Rajkot. When these two things come together, I feel we will make great progress and uh, we will make strides in the field. This is in contrast to a lot of conventional thinking in India, where people like me, experts in India, tend to be union government focused, and we tend to always look at things happening in Delhi. We tend to read and write things happening in Delhi. We tend to prioritize speaking in Delhi. And I'm just here to say that because India is a vast, complex, heterogeneous federal country, all of us need to reprioritize ourselves to be much more local in our thinking that we should be taking more interest in government of Gujarat. We should be taking more interest in Ahmedabad and we should be getting involved in local problems and we should form those bodies of expertise and contribute to knowledge that is local. And we should also then be humble that what works in Pune may not work in Nagpur. And you know, Each place is different so we've got to constantly wire ourselves that not to mechanically think that every success story reports, but it depends on context, it depends on conditions, and it depends on the highly unequal conditions, initial conditions that every city in India uh, finds itself. If some of you hear an echo of Gandhiji's conception of a village in this, yes, there is a bit of that, and it's astonishing how in the early 21st century, we are rediscovering the wisdom of some of those ways and you know, we are more skeptical about the trait of high modernism that was so fashionable and so popular in India after independence, where there was a big push from the union and the union government had a big stick and went around ordering everybody in India how to think. So I think today we are far more sympathetic about a more bottoms up approach where there is decentralization and there is legitimate local preferences, local energy, local expertise, local management practices. Okay, this part, everything I've said so far, is reasonably well understood and reasonably mainstream, okay? This is fairly established knowledge, and I'm happy to be here presenting it to you, but I just want to say to you that this is all lovely, well-known knowledge that has been refined and perfected by people all over the world. Now I want to push into two slightly novel things, and uh, I hope it will make us think in new ways. The first novel thing I want to push is on the role of migration. Okay, this is novel in India. This is absolutely normal and mainstream in the United States. Okay, so it's a United States idea, which is not being used much elsewhere in the world, but I'm starting to think is particularly relevant in India. This is the role of migration. Okay, so I, I had this brainwave when I watched the depopulation of 
sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the war in Libya and Syria and Afghanistan generating a giant flow of refugees going into Europe. Okay? And a bell went off in my head. Uh, the great political thinker Hannah Arendt, uh, who did great books about the rise of communism and Nazi ideas and philosophy in Europe in the early 20th century. Uh, Hannah Arendt once wrote a very beautiful sentence and the bell went off in my head and I connected these. She said that authoritarians tend to run out of people to oppress. Okay? And it's a striking fact that uh, the family as a unit tends to shrivel under authoritarian conditions. People get disheartened and have fewer children and migration forces set in and people start running away. Okay? The people don't like to be oppressed. Okay, the people run away from oppression. So, I noticed vast numbers of refugees leaving from Afghanistan, actually from parts of Pakistan as well, and leaving from Syria, and leaving from Libya, and other parts of Africa, and running away to Europe. And in a way, this is a bounty for Europe, because basically refugees are just great for a country. Refugees bring energy, they bring dynamism, there is uh, migrants' fever and fervor to succeed and excel. Migrants are the hardest working people. Migrants fight for the uh, effort of their children in school. Migrants become entrepreneurs at a disproportional rate, and so on. So migrants are just great for any society. To receive migrants is a privilege. Over and over and over in human history, the societies that received large amounts of migrants did well because for one or two or three generations, migrants have fervor. Okay? So all of us, for example, have seen multi-generational families from India in the United States. They just run harder for a couple of generations. Then they normalize. But for a couple of generations, migrants run harder. And it is a real privilege for Europe that the stability and the successful state creation in Europe is sucking in migrants. And of course, all of us hear about migrant flows out of India, uh, where lots of people have chosen to leave India and continue to do so. And I think that's a real privilege for the societies that receive those migrants. Now think about that process acting within India. Okay, so India is highly heterogeneous. Some states in India work dramatically better than others. What really matters for a state is people and not territory. Land is irrelevant. The people create a society. The people create an economy. The state taxes people. The resources of the state are about the people, not about the land. Okay, there's no point in conquering land. There is a point in conquering people. And actually, when you go to pre-modern times when population growth rates worldwide were low, a lot of invasions were about rounding up large amounts of people and taking them back under conditions of slavery or bonded labor so that you could do agriculture because there was a shortage of people. So the precious thing in every territory is not the land but the people. So think about the migration process in India. I think that there's an interesting process underfoot where all over India there is a migration process where people are moving from the badly performing states to the better performing states, and I mean state not as a state of India, but the state as in the monopoly on coercive power. So think of every engineer, every engineering degree in India, the smartest kids in the college wake up and say, you know what, I'm a really good geek, and then they try to run to Pune or Bangalore or Hyderabad and find a job. Okay, think of the migrant flows that are coming into Gujarat, there is a whole uh, process by which millions of people are coming to the better performing uh, parts of the country. And so it's an interesting way in which there is this new phenomenon inside decentralization that is going on. That there is decentralization. Some parts have a better political system than others. Some parts are better compatible with a liberal, open, modern society where that capitalism starts working, where prosperity starts coming. And then they start sucking in people, they start sucking in migrants. So that's another interesting dimension and this is actually the formal stated doctrine in the United States, that if you don't like the place that you live, please up and leave. 
And that is recognized as a way that creates pressure, that the cities which gain migrants and gain businesses are experiencing an economic boom. And then in those cities, the urban uh, uh, governance and the urban planning side needs to up its game and develop a whole strategy about serving those communities. And then, of course, it sees that resource envelope go up and they get the money because all those people have come in. And conversely, the cities that lose people are on a very different downward spiral where you start getting ghost towns and you know it's emptying out, the tax revenues go down and all that. So, it struck me that there is a bit of that phenomenon starting to be visible in India as well. Finally, my last thought for today is on the limits of decentralization. So the first is decentralization cannot be built in a day. Okay, so I think all of us are in that thinking process where building a republic takes time. Okay, to become a great country is going to take a long, long time. Let's not look for quick wins. Nothing can be done quickly. Okay, so. Uh, the UK and the US and all these places took hundreds of years to come to where they are and we also will require a lot of time. So building a full decentralized culture will take a lot of time and we should be comfortable with running those marathons. And the journey starts here with all of us that it is how we think, it is how we act, it is how we debate with each other. It's about our creation of norms which will generate the most sensible decentralization at first under existing constitutional arrangements, but in the future, as some of these ideas start becoming more mainstream, then we will be questioning something like a JNN URM saying, why does the union government need to do this? This is the business of the cities. So these things will take time, they will need to be fostered, capabilities will have to come up, we need to build an expert community, in uh, Rajkot and so on. Then alongside that, uh, we need to worry about the way the political system works at the subnational level in India. The subnational governments in India are far from well structured. Okay, so even in the union government, we are not in great shape in India in terms of checks and balances. So a good checks and balances world is where there is a legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, and all of them are co-equal branches of government, and all of them are in constant conflict with each other, and they exert check and balance on each other. Okay? We are not there at the union government, and we're definitely not there at the state government, and we're definitely not there at the city government. So there's a long journey on rethinking the political system to create checks and balances. All too often, what we get is that a chief minister in India has pretty much extreme powers, and a chief minister has way too much say. There needs to be far more development of checks and balances so that there is a democratic process of debate and discussion and power sharing and negotiations that happens at the subnational level. So, you know, if you ask me overnight tomorrow, if you merely send down a lot of power from the union to the state or from the union to the city, there will be unanticipated consequences that flow from the excessive concentration of power which is found at the state and the city level. So I'm at the end of my talk for today. I hope uh, this is interesting. How should we do this? Should we try to take some questions? Open up for questions now. Good evening, sir. Thank you for this wonderful uh, session. Uh, sir, while looking towards the perspective of India, basically we have a Quadri, I mean, quasi-federal structure in India, wherein we have union states and probably a concurrent list. So the power has been defined and derived from the Schedule Seventh of Indian Constitution. But to my surprise, when I was looking towards the urban planning perspective, I didn't find it in the union subject, not in state subject, not even in the concurrent list. It was in the twelfth schedule, which was later on inserted with a municipality regulation. Looking towards the future of India, 
talking about the sustainable development goal number 11, wherein we have smart cities and smart communities. So India is not considering the sustainable and smart city as a union subject, rather they are considering, as, uh, considering it as a municipality level subject. So I think there should be a national or a union level law which, which probably implements certain uh, restrictions and rules wherein, the, the, wherein there should be a sustainable cities, sustainable buildings, more efficient energy saving buildings should be constructed. So what are your thoughts on the matter, sir? Thank you. So I want to say a couple of things. The first is that on day zero, the Constitution of India is given. Okay, So none of us have any give in terms of uh, making changes to that. However, there is a lot of give in what all of us as the Republic of India do around the Constitution. So there is space to make progress. Uh, a decentralization vision, if applied into a lot of public policy, will make progress and it is a pro right now I'm just arguing in favor of an intellectual process of persuasion that the fundamental legitimacy should be in favor of a decentralized approach of greater work at the city level, modulo the bottleneck of the lack of checks and balances at the city political government level. But that objection itself has limited power because if you're going to run the city of Rajkot out of the union government, you have very little check and balance anyway. So, you know, in a way you're comparing like to like that and what you have is an extreme loss of accountability if you work through the union and you have centralized power if you work through some existing political structures at the state. We're comparing two bad and bad things. There is a lot of opportunity for us to think in more deeply decentralized ways. So I am appealing to the intellectual side of everybody in this room, okay? I'm saying to each of you that when you see amazing things that have been done in Ahmedabad, don't assume that they will always transplant to Patna. Patna is different, okay? So I, different cities are different and we should respect the heterogeneity of India and we should ask careful questions, we should look at local conditions and we should form deeply contextual solutions. Then, there is a role for norms, there is a role for legitimacy and we should constantly plead and argue saying, look, why should this be done by the union government? Why should this be done by the state government? This should be done more at the city government. We should prioritize our time and effort and engagement at the city level, saying this is the appropriate unit of organization at which we should be thinking and solving problems. There is a very long-term process through which laws and even the constitution can and will be amended. So the 73rd and 74th amendments are, in my opinion, really badly drafted, but they reflected the state of the art of the intellectual consensus at the time when Manishankar Iyer uh, and Rajiv Gandhi drafted these things. So, you know, a country can only be as good as its intellectual elite. And the intellectual elite of that time thought that the 73rd and 74th amendments were a good draft, okay? So I think the burden is upon all of us to build that knowledge. And, you know, I would look to SEPT University as a crucible of the creation of new knowledge and new doctrine around how do we think about decentralization. By the way, please, uh, we should observe the terrible thing called the concurrent list. It's a sham, it just hands over all the power to the union. Okay, so it's just a polite thing that, you know, some part is state, some part is union, and we will have some middle road on the concurrent list. But for all practical purposes, all the power in the concurrent list is handed over to the union. Once you call that out for what it is, then clearly right away it is obvious that the drafting of those lists really leaves a lot to be desired, and so on. So I am not here to say we can, we can or should radically reform the Constitution anytime soon, but laws and the Constitution do evolve over the years, and it is everybody in this room that matters and will reshape the intellectual climate around which future amendments of laws will happen. So, as I say, on one hand, I think that the drafting of the 73rd and 74th Amendment is not good. On the other hand, like it reflected that state of the art of knowledge of that time. And, you know, you wanted to do better, you needed a better intellectual class in that period.
good afternoon sir uh, so uh, in india is a complex socio political fabric and while talking about decentralization if uh, to take strong decisions which require a strong will power india needs central leadership as well as uh, some central ideology to which the state or the cities would follow so in that case don't you think decentralizing to the uh, such levels that you talked about would not it will not help us hold accountability to people because there's a general there's a personal conscious required to take decisions and implement them and think about the welfare of the people so isn't the state or the like you said chief minister has a lot of power in our system but isn't it necessary so i worry that you are dreaming of some ram rajya um the essential insight of uh, political science over 2000 years is that strong concentrated power does not work very well okay so for every one li kuan yu who was pretty much a dictator who had very beneficial impact upon singapore i can show you 50 bad dictators who messed with their country and did not do well so if there is a message that we have out of 5000 years of political science it's a message in favor of checks and balances so the phrase we should always reach for is checks and balances that more people more debate more knowledge more dispersion of power will generally do better yes on occasion there will be one good decision but for each one good decision you will have many bad decisions okay so for recent examples the whole world is noticing how for some time there was a lot of talk about the greatness of the chinese system but then you have seen how that concentrated power with xi jinping has led to serious missteps in foreign policy in the decision to crack down on the it industry and now on the decisions around the covid lockdowns so they first did some nationalism around claiming that their homemade vaccines were good enough and now they are in a complete mess around their zero covid policy and that policy is personalized around one strong leader and you know that is not a good place to be similarly think of vladimir putin making the decision to invade ukraine okay probably the decision would have worked out better if it was made through a more checks and balances process where many 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 people had a window into the decision and participated and influenced and shaped the decision so i'm not sure that your yearning for strong leaders is taking us to good outcomes so i feel that good political systems are those that are characterized by check and balance where many many forces are in conflict with each other and out of that conflict we get better outcomes so by the way on a larger scale the it is the check and balance principle that says that instead of having a single leader we have three coequal branches of government this is a 17th century idea that you have a separation of powers between an executive branch a legislative branch and a judicial branch and all the three are coequal and all the three check and balance each other nobody gets to tell the other what to do okay that's a good way to proceed same principle where you break it down vertically between a union government and a state government and a city government once again it is about dispersing power it is about reducing the amount of concentrated power that any one person has okay so if there is one deep idea out of 5000 years of thinking on politics it is this it is check and balance check and balance gives you fewer mistakes and it protects human freedom better wonderful uh, listening to you yep yeah. i have uh, three questions i'll be very uh, brief yes. question one uh, look at the state of environment whether it is delhi ahmedabad or wherever you go water pollution air pollution everything is there yes. we have cpcb we have uh, moas all of those agencies are there at the national level the state level and the local level okay as far as regulations systems of management they are all there but then we are in this paradox where environment pollution is wholly worsening yes. is it a problem of misallocation of the responsibility or it's a kind of a, a system breaking down i think that's one question mm -hmm. the second one you talked about migration and the receiver becoming uh, prospering in its economic part of it there but they also send back uh, the money back to those regions what happens to those which actually send people out i think that's maybe some some thought on that would be interesting to 
look at it. And the third one is about decentralization. Uh, I've seen elections where uh, uh, the councillors' uh, seats are auctioned. Okay, highest bidder will become unopposed you know, as an elected candidate there, and that money, whatever auction, goes into public use, like yeah. temple building, road building, whatever else it is. But the man who actually buys that seat, what will he do? Can you expect accountability to transparency? These are the three points which I thought would be interesting. To us. Thank you. These are fascinating and important questions. Let me take a stab at uh, some of this. Uh, first, you said environment, okay? Water quality, air quality, and so on. Um, there is undoubtedly a role for the state in uh, solving some of these problems. Uh, let me talk about air quality in North India as an example. Okay, so North India is in a peculiar unlucky position. There is the Vindhyas and there is the Himalayas. And in winter, there's very little wind. So what's happening is that any sources of solid particulate matter that are pumped into the atmosphere are just lingering in the atmosphere. They, they are not able to go beyond the Himalayas. They are not able to cross below the Vindhyas, and there is not a lot of wind. Okay, so it's a very unlucky position to be in. Now, let's apply subsidiarity principle. Uh, how do you want to think about this? So I think you can't really ask the city government of Lucknow to solve air quality in Lucknow because the air is cutting across all of North India. So you will need uh, some methods of spanning it that cross beyond states. By the way, there are some very interesting stories from the United States where the constitutional concepts were used by one state to sue another. So when one state creates the pollution and it flies into another state, then the recipient state of the pollution was able to sue the emitting state. And they built out that legal doctrine where this just became that you are harming me and I will sue you and you owe me damages. So there are ways to try to think about this. Um, here's another story from the United States. In the late 70s and the early 80s, uh, Los Angeles was one of the most polluted cities in the whole world. Why? Because it's a bit of a bowl, okay? Same as the Delhi problem, that the city is a bowl, it's surrounded by the San Bernardino Mountains, and the uh, pollution that was emitted by the bad quality cars of that age would just go up in the air and stay there, and there was not enough of a wind, particularly in certain seasons that took the pollution away. Well, uh, today air in Los Angeles is amongst the cleanest in the whole world. Okay, so this shows us that these problems are solvable and there is a toolkit out there. And you know, our problem as the Indian state is that not enough prioritization is being made towards doing public goods. And when we set out to solve these problems, we are not able to find the uh, check and balance and the intellectual community process through which we find the right interventions and we are able to solve the problem. This is why we are a developing country. We are all in this journey together and you know we've got to apply our minds and try to solve these problems. The second thing you said was about the uh, economic impact of migration both on source and on destination. What you say is correct that to the extent that there are remittances that go back, that is uh, a revenue stream that augments income in the recipient uh, state. But I will say that the primary wonder of a vibrant economy in Tamil Nadu that is created by a labor force in Tamil Nadu is the benefit of Tamil Nadu. We are creating a large, vibrant economy in Tamil Nadu on the back of huge amount of migration. So a small slice of that income is going back. And you know, yes, there is a backwash through which a migrant from Bihar sends some money back to Bihar. But Fundamentally, it is the Tamil Nadu economy that becomes vibrant and successful when it receives and successfully integrates migrants into his whole life. You want to do a follow-up, please? Yes. Yes. Would be much less burden. Therefore, you will have less number of people to give jobs to. Therefore, the economic development process which is happening there would also have a different kind of an impact. Yeah. Um, like UP, Orissa, okay. right now, a lot of people used to come to Surat, but now uh, it's not the case. Some people actually stay back and work there. Uh, things of that kind are also happening simultaneously. Yeah. Can I please not go further down that? It's a very fascinating subject. I'll talk with you separately. I think it'll take me far afield uh, from our main project here. Okay, and you said a third thing. I'm sorry, I'm not able to. Uh, 
decentralization. Election. Elections, yeah. So I completely agree with what you're saying. And at all levels, okay, we need to make uh, elections to the parliament work better. We need to make elections at the state legislature work better. We need to make elections at the city level work better. It's uh, our work in progress. So I classify that alongside the bin of political system reform of how do you make these things work better? They all have problems, okay? There's a reason why India is a developing country. We've got to solve all that. I'm just appealing to all of us saying that let's favor a more decentralized approach. Not that anybody is a saint. So I'm not here to offer a Ram Rajya at the state level, okay? The uh, state is always composed of self-interested characters. So politicians and officials are self-interested characters at all levels. But bearing that in mind, it appears that we will make more progress by taking the subsidiarity principle seriously of sending questions and resources and coercive power down to the lowest possible unit of government. And while I have often talked about the problem of the union government as an excessively centralizing force, there's an equally big problem about a state capital as an excessively centralizing force. Try explaining to people in Gandhinagar that Rajkot should be the master of its own destiny. You will get the same kind of problems that you get when trying to talk about decentralization in New Delhi. So it's a problem all through the place. And I'm here to talk about the value of this philosophy of more decentralization, of going closer down to the people rather than trying to build a far away uh, coercive power. Subsequently, when they translated it to a national level uh, uh, through uh, Rajiv Gandhi and that government, I, do, I think something went wrong there. I think that same problem of different parts of the country, I guess. No, a country can only be as good as its intellectual community. So, for example, you know, we are all very proud and happy about the Right to Information Act. But, you know, today with the benefit of hindsight, when you look at the drafting of that law, it leaves a lot to be desired. And, you know, it's a simplistic uh, transparency law and you know there needs to be so much more thinking and uh, deep insights into public administration before we go towards the framing of these laws. Good evening sir. Yes please. Uh, so yeah. uh, it's a wonderful talk, uh, really insightful. I have this very simple question. Ke you said we should bring the decision making to lowest people as possible, uh, like the principle. So then how do we deal with the biases of the society in general, given that India like the society in India is largely undemocratic, patriarchal, and you know they have a lot of their own religious, cultural, social biases. Then how do we deal with that? How do we really make sure that expert bubble really bubbles up from the bottom up? It's a great point, and you know, so in the early debates after independence, that was actually the lines of debate. So Gandhiji used to argue in favor of a very decentralized approach, where he felt strongly that you know each village. Each town should be the master of its own destiny, and there should be a very light union government which does almost nothing. Okay, so Gandhiji was very hostile to most of the state intervention. And there were two arguments that were brought against him, led by Nehru, and the two arguments ran in these two directions. One argument was the idea of a developmental state, that can you short circuit the development process instead of taking 200 years like happened in the history of the UK, can you get it done in a shorter time by having a leadership role for the government? Today, I think all of us would be much more circumspect about that, that you should not rush these things. They can't be rushed, and you know, good things take time. The second argument was that the local society was viewed as a hotbed of the caste system and religious prejudice. So it was thought that the union government will be this enlightened, better bunch of people. And I just want to say to you, no, I think bigotry is an equal opportunity employer and there is bigotry everywhere. So I don't think you can make any simple claims that the people at some city are better or worse than people at the state government or people at the union government. Meaning, you know, our problem of overcoming those uh, ancient problems is there everywhere. And yeah, there will be problems of this kind at every level of government. So I'm not excited that this is a decisive reason why you want to bring power to an unaccountable, faraway union government. 
Just uh, you talked of uh, decentralization from the perspective of functions. Yes. But you didn't mention anything about resources, yeah. especially fiscal resources. Yeah. And that, to my mind, isn't that a big yeah. imbalance in India and yeah. would really be great to hear your views, yeah. especially lack of local government resources. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course, what you say is correct. So I was starting out from the uh, word legitimacy. For all of us in India today, there is a very high legitimacy about union government. Union government is Sarkar. They will decide some things. They will control everything. We've got used to that. And I was on a first principles idea that you know it's good to think in a more decentralized way. But the moment you start doing that, we will run into this question about resourcing. My thought process is in two, three parts. First is that this thinking, this philosophy can and should go into the working of the Finance Commission. Okay, so the Finance Commission is supposed to be the one thinking what happens at the states and ideally it should be thinking about the third tier as well and it should be allocating a bigger slice of taxes to these other levels of government. They don't do that, but they should. I mean, as we start developing these concepts, then the behavior and the working of the Finance Commission needs to change. So uh, Vijay Kelkar and I have long been arguing in favor of a slice of the GST at the city level. Okay, so, yeah, so uh, Kelkar has long been very focused on this issue that how do you get resourcing to the city? And again, what we see in other countries is that the extent to which a local economy flourishes in a city should have a substantial impact on the envelope of resourcing available at the local government because that creates the feedback loops for the city government. So for example, if a city government dreams that shall we go build some new infrastructure, then this should be their way of thinking that we can build some new infrastructure. That will suck in migrants, people will start more businesses, we will get more GST because GST is a consumption tax. And then using those incremental revenues, we will service the bonds that we have issued. So it creates incentive compatibility in the fiscal planning of local uh, politicians at the city level. So there are many beneficial features that come from having a slice of GST that is placed at the city level. compared to, if you compare to percentage yeah. of GDP yeah. to other countries. Yeah. And you know, there is a tendency for people to say, oh, local resources, people are not collecting. But Correct. in fact, it's the other resources yeah. that are not coming. And yeah. that's no, no. probably so, maybe yeah. the underlying problem. So that's part problem. of the package, that if we start uh, dreaming about the republic in a more decentralized way, then we should be thinking of ways in which to put a lot more of the function under the uh, working of the city of Ahmedabad. And then commensurately, we need to find the channels for a lot of the resourcing to go to the city of Ahmedabad. Ajayji, it was an excellent uh, lecture. And this topic of uh, yours today is, I think, close to heart of everybody except. And that's why there's so much of discussion around it. Uh, taking forward from what Meera Ma'am just now said, um, what, what, what my research and understanding says about cities is that there is something called capability of the cities also and people who run cities. Yeah. So uh, in the current scenario in which uh, the manner in which our cities are run by uh, officials, what is the extent of decentralization, like putting in uh, resources in terms of financial resources in their hands to run the cities wherein we can see that there are certain cities who have a budgetary variance of something around ranging from 45 to even 55%. So that means that they are not even capable of planning how to spend their money and it happens in a very random manner. So the capability of the people and the extent of decentralization. Decentralization is a very powerful concept, but we should be very mindful about it. Yeah. So um, I want to ask from you that what is a better point of leverage? Is it political empowerment or is it uh, going through uh, the resources empowerment? What do you think would be a better point of leverage and a starting point? Yeah. 
So I want to say two things. Uh, Bimal Patel started with the analogy with a family in which there is a domineering, there are domineering parents who control every decision of the child. Okay, and when that child is hypothetically put into a sudden transition into an environment of complete decisional autonomy, it may not work so well because you know you need a transition of making decisions and developing that sense of responsibility and improved decision making and honing risk perception and risk tolerance and then getting to better decisions, okay? So all of us have been through those training wheels where gradually our parents let us go and it should not be sudden. And as long as parents will uh, emphasize the juvenilization of their children, then uh, the children will appear to be too weak to be given any responsibility, okay? And there's a codependency trap in there. That's what has happened with the decentralization in India. That on one hand, we have emphasized the power, the role, the responsibility, the intellectual capabilities of the union. And that has led capabilities to atrophy at the state level and the city level. And then we turn around and say, but look, these states are so weak and these cities are so weak. Okay, so I'm neither here nor there. I'm not in extremes. I see a long journey ahead of us. Nothing can be done overnight. Okay, so let's relax and rescale ourselves, that we have to find the emotional capacity in us to run long marathons, okay? We are a developing country. We have a $3,000 per capita income. We are very far from being an advanced economy, and we have to run long marathons in getting there. My main argument for today is that if all of us will shift perspective a little and be more biased in favor of a decentralized government where we will build a federal approach in our thinking about public policy, where we will learn to use the subsidiarity principle in our everyday toolkit, then we'll be on a path to progress. And that path involves many, many things. Okay? As was emphasized, it involves a funding question. As was emphasized, it involves a political system question. As you have emphasized, it is about checks and balances in the executive. Okay? So many, many moving parts are required to change. And you know, hundreds of people all of us are needed to do the thinking and the acting through which those pieces of the puzzle will fall into place. Nothing can be done quickly. But at the level of big ideas, I feel that there is a reasonably persuasive case that we are stuck with our uh, excessive centralization, with the high modernism of a developmental state that began in 1947. And uh, we need to change course and a much more decentralized approach will help us to make progress and recognize that it's a long journey. It's not something where you can throw a switch, but it's something that we have to build gradually. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Shah. Uh, wonderful discussion and I think uh, a good lecture is the one which uh, wanting to uh, I mean leave you with more questions and more debates etc so and we are very pleasantly uh, pleasant about the fact that we could do this kind of discussion in the very first lecture of this lecture series so thank you very much uh, and thank you uh, dr. Bimal Patel would you like to have some last words okay so thank you for making the contact and organizing this thank you SEPT University uh, now I think all of us have to rush to for the exhibition inauguration. Uh, so thank you very much for coming here in large numbers and thank you very much.